Hi, this is Dr. A with your clinical chemistry review video on uric acid and ammonia. Uric acid and ammonia are two of the other non-protein nitrogenous compounds that are waste. And we're going to look over these. So the first one is uric acid. So uric acid is the end product of purine nucleic acid catabolism. So your purine nucleic acids are anine and guanine. So the A's and the G's of your DNA um, and most of uric acid is going to be resorbed in the proximal tubules and reused. So on that, um, there's some interesting research going on where um, uric acid is tied to inflammation, especially what we call like sterile inflammation or inflammation that's not tied to like bacterial infections and stuff like that. But um, there's an idea that possibly uric acid might be an anti-inflammatory molecule. Anyway, there's, there's some pretty neat research around uh, other roles of uric acid. So we we're going to continue with what we know. So the um, uric acid is relatively insoluble in plasma, so it tends to crystallize. And so at high concentration, uh, those crystals can be deposited in joints and tissues. And of course, that causes painful inflammation and that would be lead to like things like gout. 70% of uric acid is eliminated by renal excretion. So as long as your kidneys are working fine, everything's good, it's leaving. Uh, the rest, the other 30% will pass into the GI tract and will be degraded there by bacterial enzymes in your gut. Elevated levels can cause kidney disease or kidney stones. So again, because uh, high levels, it can crystallize, uh, crystallize into stones, but also the crystals themselves can cause damage to the kidneys. So uh, clinical application of uric acid, so it is used for the assessment of any inherited disorders of purine metabolism. It is used for the confirmation and di of diagnosis and the monitoring of the treatment of gout. Um, and so if some patient comes in the ER with a you know, big toe that's inflamed and stuff and they suspect that he may have gout, they would, uh, or, or a gout crisis or whatever, they would uh, order a uric acid level. Uh, and it can be used in the assistance in the diagnosis of renal calculi so, or kidney stones if they suspect that it might be a uric acid stone. The, uh, it can be used in the profession of uric acid nephropathy and chemotherapy. So uh, here would be like chemotherapy. Think of like a, a leukemia where the white count is really, really high and you have those initial doses of chemotherapy to start knocking these cells down. Well, all of these white cells are going to be destroyed. And so there's all of that DNA uh, and some of this RNA and stuff that has to be recycled. And so you're going to have an upsurge in uric acid and that could crystallize and cause damage to the kidneys. So we want to make sure that, that doesn't happen. And of course, can also be used for the detection of kidney dysfunction since it's mostly cleared by the kidneys. If the kidneys aren't working right, uric acid is going to be accumulating in the blood. For the lab methods for the analysis of uric acid, there's an enzymatic method that uses uricase, there's a caraway method, and there's a, a coupled enzyme method, and there, of course, a reference method is isotope dilution mass spectrometry. Uh, uric acid is usually measured in heparinized plasma serum or urine. So again, heparinized plasma is your green top, serum is going to be your red top, and of course, urine would be in a urine sample. Um, usually you want to remove the serum or plasma from the cells quickly to prevent the dilution by any intracellular contents. Um, gross lipemia has to be avoided. High bilirubin, which would be acteria, uh, those can falsely decrease the results uh, it, that are obtained by peroxidase methods. So that would be the, usually the second enzyme in a coupled enzymatic method. Um, and then significant hemolysis can result in low values. So basically, if it's your sample is lipemic, icteric, or hemolyzed, you just don't want to use it for uric acid analysis. Um, drugs such as salicylates, aspirin, right, and thiazides, which are diuretics, uh, have been shown to increase values for uric acid. Your reference intervals for uric acid for an adult in plasma serum for a male is going to be 3.5 to 7.2 milligrams per deciliter, for females, 2.6 to 6.0. And for a child, it's going to be 2.0 to 5.5 milligrams per deciliter. Causes of hypouricemia could be liver disease, uh, defective tubular resorption. So uh, it's, you know, it normally does reabsorb some of it. If it doesn't, you know, then you can have low uric acid levels. And chemotherapy, and that would be chemotherapy like after they've had several rounds of chemotherapy and then their white count is really, really low. Then uh, with a low white count, you would expect to see hypouricemia because you have less white cells being turned over uh, because your white count is just a lot lower. 
uh, causes of hyperuricemia or high uric acid levels in the blood. Gout would be an obvious cause. Um, and anything that will increase nucleic acid turnover, so cell, which then is also cell turnover, so your fourth one, increased metabolism of cell nuclei, that would increase nucleic acid turnovers also. Um, so you can think injury and repair and that kind of stuff of cells because cells have been destroyed. Uh, any inherited disorders of purine metabolism, sort of be genetic causes. Um, chronic renal disease can cause uh, elevation because the kidneys aren't filter it, filtering it the way it's supposed they're supposed to because they're not working right. And then hemolytic and megaloblastic anemias, uh, simply because you get have a higher cell turnover. This one is going to be red cell turnover, uh, where you're making more of um, when you have these two types of uh, anemias. Your second NPN for this video is ammonia. Ammonia is uh, produced in the catabolism of amino acids during protein metabolism and by uh, the bacterial metabolism uh, in the lumen of the intestine. So uh, some ammonia will result from the anaerobic metabolism reactions uh, in muscle during exercise. So that would be you be doing anaerobic exercise at that point in time. Uh, and so you could that could produce some ammonia. Uh, it's usually just removed from circulation and converted to urea in the liver. So your liver should be functioning properly to do that. And it is excreted as the ammonium ion by the kidneys. And this ammonium ion can be instrumental in um, the buffering of urine, but an acid, also an acid-base balance and stuff. Uh, it is toxic when it's free, when it's free floating in the blood, but usually it's found in low concentrations in blood. So uh, normally it's not a cause for concern. The clinical applications. So why would we want to measure ammonia levels? Um, determination of prognosis for severe, li severe liver disease. Because the liver is what detoxifies ammonia from the blood, if your liver is really uh, not working well and uh, you're you know, probably in end stage type liver diseases and stuff, um, you're going to see your ammo the ammonia levels are starting to, to climb. Uh, it can be also used to determine severity and prognosis of Rye syndrome and to diagnose any inherited deficiency of the urea cycle enzymes and uh, monitoring hyperalimentation therapy. So that's high nutrition. So think uh, IV nutrition like uh, or NG tube nutrition and stuff like that. Um, the analytical methods are, uh, there's a two-step approach in which ammonia is isolated from the sample in an assay, and then there's also direct measurement of ammonia by enzymatic methods or by ion-selective electrodes. Spasma requirement, super important here uh, in interfering substances. So usually you can obtain venous blood uh, without trauma, so it cannot be a difficult stick, and it has to be placed on wet ice immediately. So that would be ice, usually mixing with some water. Don't use dry ice. Um, and your tubes of choice are heparin and EDTA, so the green top and the purple top. Those are both suitable anticoagulants for the plasma levels. Your samples uh, should be centrifuge uh, in a refrigerated centrifuge if you have, have it, so zero to four degrees Celsius. Uh, within 20 minutes of the collection in the plasma or serum must be removed from the cells. And then um, another thing to take note of is the patient should not smoke for several hours before collection. And some, because some of the sources of uh, contamination and sources of error include tobacco smoke, also urine and ammonia in detergents, uh, glassware, reagents, and water. So usually that's not a problem, but if uh, your uh, water that's coming into your system is not pure, that could be an issue. The reference interval for ammonia. The, uh, for the adult, the plasma level is 19 to 60 milligram, uh, micro, sorry, micrograms per deciliter. For the child, anywhere from 10 days to 2 years in plasma is going to be 68 to 136 micrograms per DL. Uh, elevated concentrations are seen in severe liver diseases, uh, encephalopathy, so swelling of the brain, and inherited deficiency of enzymes of the urea cycle. Uh, on a side note, um, if there is increased ammonia levels because the liver, for example, is not working, those high ammonia levels will cause like mental status changes and stuff, and uh, your patients will be really confused because it is tied to um, 
the encephalopathy that it causes uh, or that follows severe liver disease. Anyway, it tends to be, you know, metal status change and high ammonia level tend to go together. And that is the end of the video. Thank you so much.